The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. As always, very glad to have you with us. We have a fantastic show lined up for you today. In about 30 minutes, Alpha Architects Wes Gray will be joining us on the program. Wes is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer at Alpha Architect, and they recently launched two new ETFs. They're called Momentum Shares. They have a U.S. stock version and an international stock version. And the idea here is to take advantage of what has been called the premier anomaly in investing, which is momentum. And Jason, we covered this topic last year. We had one of the foremost experts on momentum investing on the show, Gary Ananasi. He wrote the award-winning book, Dual Momentum Investing. And our conversation with Gary, by the way, was one of our most downloaded podcasts ever. So we thought this would be a great topic to readdress. Wes Gray is certainly an expert in this area. And I think the best way to think about momentum investing is to simply go back to Sir Isaac Newton's famous laws of motion, the first of which is objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Well, momentum investing applies that logic to stocks and other investments. The momentum is one of my favorite topics. You know, it was it was called the premier anomaly. I, I think anomaly sometimes has a negative comment connotation. In this case, it's a positive connotation. It means there are potentially excess returns available to investors. Uh, and I would also say that many investors, if not most, momentum's not typically something that they incorporate in their portfolio. It's out there but it's not necessarily utilized as much as it can be. So that'll be a great discussion with Wes. You know, there's just not that many free lunches in investing, so this will be a great discussion. The momentum in, on an offensive sense can potentially enhance returns, but I think it's actually interesting that used correctly, it can give you defensive protection. So you can play offense and defense using momentum. So you have these top drawer strategies that the pros use. Now they're combined in an ETF wrapper for tax efficiency and transparency. This is neat stuff. It is. So Wes Gray will join us in about a half an hour. As I mentioned last week, Wes is a tremendous interview. We've had him on the show before. Really, you're not going to find many individuals in investing with his mix of intelligence and candor. So uh, we certainly look forward to our conversation with Wes. We'll also have our weekly market update later in the show. We'll, of course, talk about what happened with stocks last week. And we have an interesting letter we're going to share with you from a hedge fund that's shutting down. This really caught our attention, and we're going to explain why in our market update. Uh, As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFstore.com. You can email us at advice at etfstore.com, or you can message us through Twitter. Now, I want to start the show today with a piece that came out last week from Eric Balcunas. He's the senior ETF analyst over at Bloomberg. It was titled Five Key Takeaways from 2015 ETF Flows. I, I tweeted this out, and when you hear ETF flows or fund flows, This is simply the investor dollars moving into and out of ETFs and mutual funds. Uh, Now, listen to this. According to Eric, ETFs took in $238 billion in 2015. That was just shy of their record from 2014. But here's the real story. No other investment even came close to ETFs. Jason, the money that went into ETFs in 2015 was more than the flows into index funds active mutual funds, and hedge funds combined. All together. Think about that. Investors put more money into ETFs than all of these other investments combined. 
investors, you know, as a group can be pretty smart. They vote with their money. They put it in a place where they think they have the best chance of success. You know, we've documented uh, in previous shows the SPIVA report that talks about performance issues with actively managed mutual funds. And I think, you know, the word is on the street that there's other alternatives. But when you mention $238 billion, $238,000 million, that's what that number is, where's, that wasn't printed out of thin air. Come on, this isn't the Federal Reserve. We can't do that. <laughs> Those are investor dollars. Where do they come from? And so when you look at the flip side of this coin, $150 billion of those dollars came out of actively managed mutual funds. And I think that really tells the tale of what's happened. It's just remarkable that the, the fund flows for, for one type of product have lapped the field. I, you know, this is a huge wake up call. If folks, you know, many of our listeners are, are big advocates of ETS and using their portfolios. But if you're not there yet, I would I would ask you this question. If you consider yourself a good steward of your own capital and you're trying to do the right thing and put your money in the right place for your family, for your business, for your charity, and you haven't looked at ETFs, I think, wow, this is a big wake up call. Well, yeah. And we've talked plenty on past shows about why this is happening, that ETFs tend to have lower costs, especially compared to active mutual funds. And without question, compared to hedge funds, there's been a rise in passive management because active managers continue to underperform. And the bulk of ETFs are index-based. They're passive. You have greater transparency with ETFs. You know what you own every single day. That's not the case with mutual funds and hedge funds. You can trade ETFs during the day. You can't do that with mutual funds and hedge funds. Uh, and of course, ETFs tend to be more tax efficient than these other types of funds. All of these things are, are sort of collaborating together to incentivize investors to use ETFs. And that's exactly what investors are doing. They, they've just become mainstream. You know, early on in, in, in our firm's history and in, in the show, you know, for a lot of people, what does that ETF stand for? We're way beyond that now. Investors are voting with their dollars. And it's it's just they're just it's amazing the flows we're seeing. And, you know, you didn't you mention that, it, you know, many firms platforms, they trade for free now. So one of the last hurdles that folks had for adopting, you know, has gone away. It's the low cost issue, though. Uh, you know, we, we talk about this. It's so important. In a roaring bull market, costs typically typically get swept under the rug. You know, if you're if you're compounding your wealth at double digit returns, you know, not much else matters. It's just human nature. But we're we're in perhaps a low. I know we're in a low yield world. You know, we all know where interest rates are at. You know, potentially the stock market's richly valued. If we if the market delivers, you know, less than average returns, positive but not quite the the historical average. That expense ratio is is a bigger deal. And so for investors who are concerned about leaving money on the table, this is a big, big, big deal. But I, I want to make one more point on this. The rise in the adoption of ETFs, I think back, you know, for many, many, many decades, investors had no real way to get broad exposure, retail investors, get broad exposure to the market on their own other than mutual funds. You know, it, just for, for better or for worse, that was the only game in town. And a byproduct of that is that it's really hard to benchmark my portfolio against anything if I really don't have another alternative. It's one thing to say, well, I, it's plus or minus the S&P 500, but if I can't really access it anyway, why, was I, why would I bother comparing? ETFs have changed that. Now, every investor can say, active manager or hedge fund manager or pension manager, I see your historic returns. I have access to the market myself on a very attractive cost structure. What are you doing for me? So investors have a way to benchmark themselves. And I think that is just a tremendous advantage now for the individual investor. Well, you know, you keep mentioning cost. And I hate to keep harping on investment costs. I know I sound like a broken record uh, every week on the show. But here again, we continue to see fee cuts from ETF providers. We saw that last year. We talked about this at the end of December with Tushar Yadava from iShares. iShares lowered the costs on some of their most popular ETFs and made one of those ETFs the lowest cost ETF available. And then not two hours later, Charles Schwab responded by announcing they were going to match that lowest cost ETF. Nate, Nate, it's almost like they had the press release already written. It's amazing. Then you look, uh, Vanguard recently announced fee reductions on 21 of their ETFs. Listen to this. The average 
expense ratio for a Vanguard ETF. So what so what you pay in annual fees a year, your annual management fee, is now 0.13% or $13 for every $10,000 invested. And, and that includes U.S. stocks, international stocks, emerging market stocks, U.S. bonds, international bonds. Vanguard has ETFs for all of these. And, and again, I know I'm a bit of, of a broken record on fees, but we can't emphasize this enough. This is a huge game changer for investors. Well, you may be you may be a broken record, but I like the song you're playing. <laughs> it, it's it's so attractive. It, it, take it a step further. You know, certainly the passive strategies have really taken hold in light of some of the underperformance in other areas. But I would also tell you that with the growth of of this industry, the active strategies are taking hold. So if you can get a, an active strategy that shows alpha in a tax-efficient cost, you know, very, very attractive cost structure, well, you really have something neat there. So you can, you can, do, you can add those top-shelf strategies to an ETF wrapper. That marriage is neat. And, in fact, later on in the show, we will visit with Wes Gray of Alpha Architect, and he's one of the providers that's working in this area. Well, you're right. Alpha Architect is a perfect example of an ETF provider offering institutional-caliber professional strategies to everyday investors and doing so at a low cost, because why in the world would you overpay for an underperforming mutual fund manager when you can get similar strategies, if not more advanced and more disciplined at a fraction of the cost with ETFs? And investors are saying, you're right, we're not doing that anymore. And that's why they're looking uh, to ETFs. But going back to Eric Balkunas' article, I thought the fact that more money went into ETFs than index funds mutual funds and hedge funds combined. That, that's what really caught my attention. But I do want to quickly highlight some of uh, his key takeaways from 2015 ETF flows. One of the takeaways was that smart beta ETFs, including currency hedged ETFs, which we've talked a lot about uh, over the past year, they both saw big inflows. Uh, Eric mentioned how smart beta is really the automation of active management, which goes back to what we were just saying. So that was a big theme in 2015 and and one we certainly expect to continue. Uh, A second takeaway Eric had was that international ETFs took in nearly half of all flows. In other words, investors were looking outside of the U.S. in 2015. And in particular, currency hedge ETFs were very popular. Uh, You look at Wisdom Tree's European hedge stock ETF that had the most inflows of any ETF. Uh, And Jason, this is a theme we heard a lot about last year, not just the currency hedging, but investors looking internationally on the whole. It's a good thing for investors to look overseas. Uh, A couple of reasons. Right now, again, we've talked over over past shows that valuations in this country, you know, tend to be on the high side of many historical uh, measures. And so investors are looking for better values. You know, it's it's you know, when we go to the grocery store, we want to buy things that are on sale. Well, it's the same way in the investment world. We want to buy stocks or future cash flows as inexpensively as we can. And with the innovation in ETFs, there are actually country-specific ETFs, you know, Brazil or Russia or China. So if you have a strong, strong investment thesis for a particular region, particular country, you can actually get that kind of exposure. I, I think the other one of the other reasons that international, that the space has grown and investors are looking overseas is that they're really overcoming their home bias. And that we, we, we have a behavioral focus on this show at, at times, but home bias simply means that we're all creatures of habit. And, you know, as citizens of the United States, we're very comfortable in our country. We're familiar with the names. We know how the laws work. We know how our stock markets work. And so it's easier to invest here emotionally than a country you've never heard of. You don't know how the stock market works. You don't know how the regular, regulatory environment is. Well, in the global world that we live in that's so interconnected, it is much easier to let go of some of those hesitations and take advantage of these opportunities. And I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah, obviously, you know, ETFs have made it significantly uh, easier to invest internationally. And, and we do need to head a breaker. But quickly, a third takeaway I wanted to highlight from Eric's piece was that iShares took in the most investor dollars with Vanguard ETF second. But what I found particularly interesting was that two ETF providers, Charles Schwab uh, and then Wisdom Tree, had Huge jumps in assets to the tune of 30% plus. And here again, you have the low cost theme with Schwab and then currency hedged ETFs with Wisdom Tree. But Jason, there were a number of smaller players as you look down the, the flows 
who had huge jumps in, in assets. Well, they did. Another theme that we see is that many of the traditional mutual fund providers are throwing their hat in the ring. I mean, let me re- give you a couple of names. And, and even if you're not a industry wonks, the, these are these are big names. John Hancock, Leg Mason, Oppenheimer, Goldman Sachs, the famed investment bank. You know, the, the writing's on the wall. We know where the flows are going. We know where investors are putting their money. And some companies are early to the game. Others are just trying to catch up. Well, I think we may ultimately look back on 2015. Is the year when the baton was really passed from mutual funds to ETFs, even though mutual funds still have significantly more dollars invested in them uh, overall? There's a clear trend where ETFs are growing at a far faster rate than mutual funds. And you look at active mutual funds in particular, they're hemorrhaging money. This has been going on for several years now. So considering that last year ETFs took in more money than index funds, active mutual funds and hedge funds combined, and you look at all of these old guard mutual fund companies now getting involved in ETFs, I just think we've reached the point where ETFs are no longer the future of investing. Uh, They're now the story of investing, and and I think that's a wonderful thing for investors. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. And later, Alpha Architects Wes Gray will join us. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837 or visit ETFstore.com. You know what's really great? A trip to Italy. The food, the wine, the coffee, the pasta, the pizza. It's fantastic. You can't go to Italy right now? Not a problem. Tell you what you do. Go to Bella Napoli. That means beautiful Naples in Italian. Brookside. Bella Napoli in Brookside. They got all that and sidewalk cafes too. You will love Bella Napoli. Tell Jake Imperiali. I sent you. He'll know what I'm talking about. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without giving up dependability let us be your personal shipping assistant call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com the u.s economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace yet many americans don't understand the parameters of this competition why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives the simple answer is nobody ever taught them The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. 
It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature Racy and Jason Link in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Last week was one of the worst starts to a year for stocks in history. The S&P 500 and Dow Jones Industrial Average were both down about 6%. And the NASDAQ was down 7% for the week. And there were several factors causing concern among investors. But China and then the falling price of oil led the way. And Jason, we're going to circle back to China here in just a moment. But as we were watching the markets last week, we came across something we thought was highly relevant. And we don't usually share these types of things on the show. But frankly, we just thought this was too interesting to not discuss. Now, over the past several months, and really this goes back a year or so, there has been a significant increase in hedge fund closures. And many of these hedge funds have closed simply because of poor performance. As a matter of fact, the average hedge fund has trailed the S&P 500 for seven straight years now. But there's a hedge fund from Nevsky Capital. This has about $1.5 billion invested in it. Nevsky announced they were shutting the fund down even though it's had exceptional performance. Bloomberg notes this fund has returned, listen to this, 18.4% annually since 2000, which is 10 times more than the average hedge fund. So that begs the question, why would a hedge fund with such a great track record just close up shop? And so, Jason, you did some poking around on this last week, and, and you actually came across the letter Nevsky sent to its clients regarding why they were closing. It's an intriguing situation, and you're right. We don't necessarily go in this direction with this radio show, but this is compelling. Uh, it's one guy, a smart guy, that's been very successful. Um, and it has been more widely reported now that, that, that when, you know, it was, it was a very, it's a, it's a voluminous letter. It's not a, a, a quick, quick note. Um, I think it's important for everybody to understand what a hedge fund is. We use that term a lot. A hedge fund is simply a pool of capital managed by a manager, typically for what are called accredited investors. You know, high net worth people, higher incomes tend to be more sophisticated, or at least they have a lot of money. They are, they run specific strategies. Sometimes they're very sophisticated. The cost structure is different than a mutual fund or an ETF fund for sure. And they're typically illiquid. So these are, these are, what we call the smart money guys. You know, these are supposedly high net worth, sophisticated, smart money managers, you know, able to generate excess returns that the normal guy may not have access to. Um, but when you have someone like that that's done a great job, has been a great steward of their client's capital, and they're literally calling their clients and saying, we're sending your money back to you. That is a huge red flag. That is really, really interesting because as a money, as a firm that manages money, we, we want to manage more money, just the same way that doctors want to see more patients. That's what we do. That's our profession. So to have someone in our, in our profession say, I'm out, um, especially someone with such an esteemed track record, it, 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 it leads to you really want to poke around and see what's going on. No, and that's why it really caught our attention. I mean, you know, we're always looking at different research articles and and, and looking for different viewpoints on the market just to supplement our own. And, and that's why, you know, this particular one caught our attention because it was such a, an oddball for, for our industry. So in any event, Nevsky Capital sent out this fairly lengthy letter to clients, and they said they were closing the fund because basically they don't think the markets are fairly compensating investors for the risk they have to take on. And they laid out some very specific reasons, including that markets have become less transparent. They referenced China's GDP as an example, that their GDP is either intentionally overstated or simply inaccurate. They talked about how uh, because of politics and nationalism, countries are no longer acting rationally. 
And, and, you know, as I thought about this, for me, a country like Russia comes to mind, right? No, nobody knows what, what Putin will do next. And so that makes the market environment highly unpredictable. Uh, they talked about the rise of algorithmic trading, uh, which they say has increased market volatility, where you basically have computers trading back and forth with each other. Uh, Jason, they go on and on. As you mentioned, this was a, a very lengthy, uh, in-depth piece. But effectively, they conclude the letter by saying the markets are broken, and the basic laws of economics no longer apply. You know, and again, this just caught our attention given everything that we currently have going on in the markets. It, it's certainly an outlier, but it's an outlier by someone who's very respected. Now, again, this is one man's opinion, one firm. But this firm specializes in bottom-up and top-down analysis. By bottom-up, I mean they'll dig into the financials of a specific company or opportunity. Top-down simply means they look at regions and economies and monetary policy and the big-picture stuff. And between all of that, they arrive at their specific mix of investments. So they're saying what we used to do doesn't work anymore. Um, I would also say, though, that they were the, – markets may be broken, but I think a better way to say that is that temporarily the laws of economics have been suspended. <laughs> There's, that, that's the point they make. Um, what does this mean for investors? Um, you know, most of us aren't going to participate actively in some of these hedge funds, but we can take you know a few of the nuggets of wisdom – your year-end statements, if you haven't already received them for 2015, are coming out. To me, if you don't like what you see, maybe what you're doing isn't necessarily going to work in the future the way you thought it was. And maybe that's the point that these guys at Nev Nevsky Capital are making. So this is a great time. This is one of those little bells that goes off that say, maybe I should take a little deeper look at my portfolio and get a sense for how it's performing relative to the economy. They mentioned – there's a laundry list of points that they mentioned that, that don't make sense. Uh, the two that stuck out to me in addition to the one that you mentioned is the, the fat tail risk. That's simply the chances of something really bad happening are increasing. doesn't mean they're extremely likely, but it means the 200-year flood is now the 50-year flood or the 50-year flood is now the 10-year flood. And so destruction of capital is a dirty, dirty word for these guys. And so they don't want to see the probability of – catastrophe increasing. But to your point also, that, that really to add on what you said about Russia and Putin, and that's just one example, you know, our, our leaders, our leaders, our country's leaders around the world and policymaker and central banks making rational decisions. And Nevsky Capital would argue that in many cases, they're not. Well, so at, at the end of the day, Nate, the, the rules may have changed. And I think we all need to be aware of that. There's certainly tremendous opportunity ahead. It may be in a different place than it was in the past. Well, and one of the reasons why we thought this was relevant to talk about on the show this particular week, just look at what happened with China last week. This was a repeat of August of last year where China unexpectedly devalued their currency. And next thing you know, the markets are in a full panic over the health of China's economy and, and the impact this devaluation has elsewhere. Uh, then you have the Chinese government uh, seemingly making up rules for their stock market on the fly. Uh, I've actually seen the Chinese stock market referred to uh, as a casino, only with less uh, stringent rules and regulations. Uh, but the key here is China is worried about China. A, a lower yuan makes Chinese goods cheaper around the world. So you have elements of nationalism here, uh, certainly unpredictability in, in how their markets operate. What we saw last week from China in, in, and then the impact on the overall markets, to me, was really exhibit A uh, on what the Nevsky letter was speaking to. They, they play a tough, tough, tough game in the hedge fund world. And what they require is that I know the rules. Whatever they are, I need to know them ahead of time. And they can't change in the middle of the game or we blow up. And so they're saying, in a sense, I'm going to take my ball and go home. You know, maybe we wrap up with this. You know, we had some fun last week on our show at the expense of some of the pundits and prognosticators about making predictions. But on this subject of volatility and specifically China, it's hit mainstream press. You know, the, the, the financial talking heads of the world, it's starting to get, you know, that level. So I think this is an issue that's only going to grow in awareness and concern. And maybe the Nevsky Capital won't be the last. We'll have to see. You know, all that being said, I mean, when you look at some of these, you know, potential structural issues in the market, that doesn't change what an everyday investor should do and how they should approach the market. And, and there's really three things that come to mind for me. 
for for every investor out there as you look at the markets uh, right now and and certainly you, you go back to 2015 when it was a flat to negative return environment you look at uh, how poorly we've begun 2016 there, there's three things one you have to think long term uh, whatever your financial goals are whatever the plan is you put in place let that plan work out over the long term. You don't want to react to short-term noise. Uh, number two, along with that, you have to have patience. You have to have patience in, in letting that strategy work, letting that plan work that you have put in place. And, and then last, and, and we, we always talk about this, it, it's a little uh, you know, maybe cliche in the investment world, but uh, diversification. You have to have a diversified portfolio. And, and certainly when we see market events like we saw last week, there are a lot of of different asset classes that that go down together, a lot of different investments that go down together, but not everything. You, you know, I, I look at gold last week, which which had you know was up four percent plus. You know, there if you have a, a well diversified, globally diversified portfolio, you can insulate yourself to a certain degree from some of these market declines. That's a great point about being patient in long term. We, we bring up this article not as a uh, to raise alarm bells and have people run for the hills. But it's just one little data point, and it really does point out the fact that you can't, as interesting as this is, and, and I wish them all the best, you know, that's one data point. There are a lot of opportunities for individual investors. In fact, I would argue there's some opportunities that individual investors have that guys running billion-dollar hedge funds don't have because to move the needle, they've got to move it. They've got to do a lot of different things. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting world we live in, but certainly not time to panic, but an interesting point. All right, we need to head a break here. Uh, but I do want to mention that on next week's show, Mike Strain, who is the Deputy Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, he'll be joining us to talk U.S. economy. Uh, so the American Enterprise Institute is one of the preeminent think tanks in the country. And Mike has been on, on CNN, CNBC. Uh, he, he's a contributor to the Washington Post. He's very well respected. So we'll hear firsthand from him about the health of the U.S. economy. And I think that should be very interesting, just given everything we, we currently have going on in the markets right now. So be sure to join us for that. Again, that's uh, next Tuesday. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Wes Gray, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at Alpha Architect. We'll be spotlighting their new Momentum Shares ETFs. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapists, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at mymassagebliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products and categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. Go with Regal, distributing service and solutions since 1955. 
Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese & Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME. Or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF Store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store. Show Nature Racy and Jason Lank in studio today. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,800 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Momentum Shares U.S. Quantitative Momentum ETF. The ticker on that is QMOM. This is offered by Alpha Architect, and joining us via phone from just outside Philadelphia to discuss this ETF is Wes Gray, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at Alpha Architect. Uh, Wes, as always, a pleasure to have you joining us. Hey, gentlemen. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Appreciate it. Well, Wes, we've had you on the program before to talk about value investing. Of course, value investing has proven to be a, a market anomaly where investors can potentially earn better risk-adjusted returns. Well, another market anomaly appears to be momentum. And I love sports analogies. Uh, And in a piece you wrote, you say that if a basketball player hits several shots in a row, the commentators say he has a hot hand. In finance, that's momentum. Uh, Can you elaborate on this for us? Uh, How do you explain what momentum investing is uh, just to the layperson? Sure. So uh, it, m- most people know value, and a lot of times the, the typical reasoning behind why value works is essentially defined as an overreaction to poor short-term fundamentals. Um, the, the irony is a lot of people that are value investors think momentum investing is insane, but when you read the behavior on momentum investing, it's essentially an underreaction to good short-term fundamentals. So classic momentum strategies, when we talk, when we're talking about this at the stock selection level, they're really relative strength strategies. And they just recently, in the last 20 years, been called momentum strategies. And, and all you're doing is if you have a thousand securities at the most basic level, you sort those securities on, say, their last 12 month returns. Um, and you want to, at least the evidence suggests that you'd want to focus on say, the top 100 stocks that have the highest relative 12-month returns um, and avoid securities that have the worst relative 12-month returns. And, and that's at the very essence of momentum strategies, which probably better to call them relative strength, but people don't do that anymore. Um, that, that, that's how the strategy works. Good morning, Wes. This is Jason Lank. You mentioned that some of the reasoning behind why these factors work are overreaction or underreaction yeah. by in, by investors. It sounds like I should have gotten a psychology degree rather than a business degree. It, it, do people underestimate or underappreciate the effect that investor behavior has on these on these factors? Um, I think so. Like, like momentum is actually a really counterintuitive one. 
Um, because, again, it goes back to value. It's really against the religion. Like even Warren Buffett says, why would you ever, why would you get excited when a price goes up? Um, and for, you know, many respects, that's actually a really good point. But what's interesting about momentum strategies is the evidence is actually even more compelling that momentum is more of an anomaly than, than value investing is. And so a lot of academic research is focused on, well, why is this? And if it is an anomaly, it, it's outset it has to be derived or, or based in some sort of behavioral bias problem. Um, and, of course, a lot of people have done a lot of following research, and most of the time the explanations for momentum are there are some institutional reasons, but it's all about investor behavior, disposition effects. You're, like, you're supposed to let your winners ride and cut your winners short or your losers short. What do people really do? They cut their winners short and let their losers ride, you know? <laughs> Even though you can tell people that they're blue in the face that, you know, you should follow the mantra because it actually works, they just don't do it because uh, it's, you know, buried in monkey brain to, uh, you know, have a disposition effect. Okay, Wes, so Alpha Architect recently launched two ETFs that attempt to capture uh, this momentum premium, mm -hmm. and, and these both follow the same process. So let's focus on the Momentum Shares U.S. Quantitative Momentum ETF, ticker QMOM. Uh, tell us what this ETF does. Sure. So what we're trying to do is essentially deliver the, an active momentum factor that what we think is the best of breed approach to actually exploit that anomaly. And it just real high level, when you think about momentum there's, and you look at the actual evidence on how the strategies work, there's two things that drive the performance at a real high level. One, the number of securities in the portfolio, and then two, the turnover of that portfolio. And it is literally systematic, where if you have more concentration and higher turnover, momentum strategies, at least from a historical perspective, will have higher performance. Uh, and this, we're talking about gross right here, right? Um, and, of course, a lot of that is driven by frictional securities and scalability. So if you want to set up a fund that's going to have huge scalability, you can't hold 50 stocks. you got to hold 250 stocks, right? Because now instead of a billion dollars, I could jam $20 billion into the strategy. Similarly, when it comes to turnover, you know, one could – rebounds that portfolio every month, but that would incur a ton of frictional costs. They could do it every quarter. They could do it every year, but there, there's a trade-off. More turnover, more returns, but also less scalability and more frictional costs. So we're, how we've designed our product in this momentum space specifically, before we even talk about how we think about how to do momentum, it's important to understand that Structurally, the portfolio is aiming to have 50 securities, which is a trade-off we've decided up front. Well, we're not going to have huge scalability, and we're going to have a ton of tracking error, but we're going to at least deliver on the active benefit of momentum if that does exist. And then as far as turnover, we've chosen to go a quarterly, essentially, and then we exploit some seasonality effects where we're not going to go monthly because it's just a frictional cost and the operational risk is too high to do that. But quarterly still capture most of it, um, you know, without destroying the returns, uh, expected returns, you know, net of cost. So more concentrated, reasonable turnover, that is two ingredients that have to be included in any momentum strategy. Um, now, as, as far as how is our momentum strategy different than just generic relative strength on the past 12 months? Um, well, there's basically two muscle movements that, that we're exploiting. Um, one is the path dependency of momentum. So if you read all the research out there on how do you use momentum as a stock selection tool, one of the, the recurring themes is that how that momentum is formed tends to predict whether that momentum will continue in the future. What do I mean by that? Well, if we have a biotech that's up 100% because it just got FDA approved yesterday, and then we have another firm that's some boring, whatever, manufacturing firm that's gone up 50 bips over the last 200 days, they're both 100% return, and presumably they're both going to be in the category of high momentum securities. However, how that momentum was created 
the path dependency of it is much different, right? The biotech just shot up once in a day. The other one kind of was a slow grinder. Well, it turns out that however you determine how you're going to quantify that, it's at those slow grinding momentum stocks are the ones that tend to be the ones that continue to grind with positive momentum in the future, whereas these high momentum stocks that are just volatile as heck, they, you know, on average they tend to be essentially efficiently priced. Like you're not going to gain huge benefits over just buying a Vanguard fund. So, so we, we exploit that core element as a key differentiator in our momentum process. Wes, several of the steps in your investment process you, you've described, you, number two, generic momentum screen, and yeah. then you screen for quality. And I think that's what you're referring to in terms of the shape yeah. or the return. Is that what you mean by quality momentum? Yeah, yeah, that's what we mean. So so you can you can go out there and buy generic momentum, which is just for ease, just the last 12 months, rank all the securities, buy the ones that had the best 12-month momentum. But we're looking for the quality of that momentum because not all momentum is, is essentially created equal. Um, and, and that's just – that's what's in academic research. That's what our own research indicates, and we're just – we're evidence-based folks, so, so that's uh, what we do. Well, the, the next step now uh, is a momentum seasonality screen. Yeah. Would, you, would you make the case that momentum varies by spring, summer, fall, winter? Uh, not exactly that, but, yes, it definitely has seasonality effects. It, it, it's, it's not me making the case. It's just this is what the evidence – suggests and what the research suggests. And, and basically what it is is it's driven by two factors. Uh, one is a thing called window dressing, which if you're unfamiliar, in, there's a ton of research in the mutual fund space where a lot of times what a manager will want to do is, is even if they've picked the wrong stocks, when they post that quarterly report, they want it to look pretty, right? They want it to have a nice window dress on it. So you know, you don't want to – even if you pick the bad stocks on 331, you want to make sure that whatever you post on your official filing looks good. Um, and so what happens is usually the stocks that, quote-unquote, look good are high-momentum stocks. And there's kind of this, I guess, flow uh, activity where mutual funds want to window dress their portfolios which is going to occur right before quarter ends. And so momentum effects are really strong, basically, if you front run this institutional flow for window dressing. So if you form those momentum portfolios, say, at the beginning of March, the beginning of June, the beginning of September, and the beginning of December, as opposed to at the end of those months where the window dressing effect is already taken place, you know, the premiums are, are much higher. And then general momentum premiums, in those off kind of front running the window dressers, they're they're not that high. They're they're, they're non existent. So it's all about basically front running the flows um, from window dressing. And then another element that, that is really important, especially in U.S. securities towards the end of the year, is obviously the tax element, which is much more intuitive because in November and December, if you have a, a high momentum stock, it's a stock that's gone up. You're probably not going to want to sell that, you know, <laughs> right at the e- end of the year because you're going to have to pay taxes. And same thing, low momentum securities are your losers. So you're going to want to sell those at the, you know, at the end of the year there to kind of book your tax loss. Um, so momentum is, is just magnified at, at the end of the year. Um, and then it, it's actually weird, but in January, it actually, it's the one month where momentum strategies actually actually have poor performance because and the argument is that what's happening is tax loss traders are basically unwinding those trades where they're now selling their high momentum and buying back into their low momentum names they didn't like. Um, but other than that, momentum's good, but there's definitely seasonality elements to momentum stocks. So, Wes, as it relates to your U.S. quantitative momentum ETF, at the end of the day, you're, you're seeking a portfolio of about 50 to 60 stocks with the highest quality momentum, is that the best way to to, to sort yeah. of summarize this? Okay, you, you got it. We're, we're just we're trying to exploit the momentum anomaly in a smart way, so we're focused on quality momentum, and then our rebalance. We're, we're always worried about frictional costs versus expected performance. We've chosen to set up our rebalance to basically exploit the seasonality effects that I'm talking about. So we're essentially front running window dressers. So our rebalances are you know, right before those quarter ends or, you know, a few weeks before because we were trying to get ahead of, like, institutional flows on these high-momentum names where, 
you know, we know just organically and, and not really related to fundamentals, you're going to see capital flows come into these things just because people want their, you know, their books to look good at, on the quarter marks. Now, I mentioned you launched two momentum-focused ETFs. The other is the Momentum Shares International Quantitative Momentum ETF, ticker IMOM. Uh, you use the same process here. This just holds international stocks. Uh, is that correct? That, that's correct. Um, we do the same same core uh, concepts, but applied internationally. You got it. Again, we're visiting with Wes Gray, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at Alpha Architect. We're spotlighting their new Momentum Shares ETFs. Wes, anytime we look at investments or, or strategies where there, there is a claim of potential longer-term outperformance, we always ask the question of, why isn't everyone else doing this? Uh, so I'll yeah. ask you this question. Why aren't more advisors and, and more investors using momentum strategies if they can potentially uh, provide outperformance? Um, yeah, that, that's a, uh, a great question. And um, we always talk about this idea of what we call a sustainable active investing framework. Where if, if you can't identify what who the worst poker player is, and you can't identify who the best poker player is, you don't really have an edge. Um, in momentum, we're of the opinion, based on evidence and based on some of the psychology research, that there are a lot of bad poker players that transact in momentum stock. That creates the opportunity. But then the second question is, well, fine. Why the hell is everyone else doing it if it's you know everyone's got they can hire a bunch of PhDs and figure this out as well. Well, momentum strategies, especially run how we run them, which is concentrated with a ton of tracking error, and just we're literally just taking on massive career risk because these strategies will deviate from standardized benchmarks by extreme amounts. Um, a lot of capital out there that, that manages capital on behalf of other people you know, they're weary about going down that route because if you deviate too much from a standard benchmark over a short horizon, you're not going to have a job anymore. Um, we've just chosen to say, well, fine, we're just going to do that on purpose and go identify the capital that actually has long duration, long horizon. And that essentially is the edge because there's way more capital that's short horizon kind of benchmark focused and a lot less capital that's focused on exploiting long-term, long-duration anomalies. Um, and, and so we think we've just designed our strategy to be very, very difficult for, you know, a huge institutional, short-minded, you know, consultant-driven, uh, short-horizon benchmark focus. They're just not going to want to do these things. And it's just volatile as hell, um, which also prevents people from doing it. And it risk-adjusted – it's a great long-term bet in expectation, but in the short run, I mean, momentum strategies are, are going to make people want to, you know, dive off the, the cliff at, at certain points, but that's part of the reason why it works. It's really hard to arbitrage and really hard to, you know, stick with. Um, so our stuff is definitely not for everyone. Well, Wes, we have about a minute left. I was going to ask you, is that the biggest risk to, to, to momentum investing, just this potential for higher volatility, maybe bigger potential drawdowns? Yeah, definitely. Mo momentum investing is you're, you're, you're capturing a lot more potential expected return, but you are definitely eating, you know, higher expected max drawdowns. So, you know, obviously you probably want to deploy and use the ETF as maybe a tool in a, in a broader context where you, you know, do trend following or, or some sort of tactical rule because buy and hold momentum is, um, yeah, that, that that's a challenge. I mean, it's a great strategy if you genuinely have, you know, 10-year horizon and you can eat big drawdowns and compound out of that. But, it, yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, a retiree is not going to put all their money in a momentum fund. That would that would be, uh, that'd be tough um, to say the least. Well, Wes, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, as always, we greatly appreciate you joining us today. Uh, fantastic spotlight. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it, gentlemen, and I look forward to chatting in the future. Thank you. Yep. That was Wes Gray, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at Alpha Architect. And you can learn more about their lineup of ETFs by visiting alphaarchitect.com. Jason, we have about, about a minute left here. You know, as I think back to our discussion earlier in the show about uh, ETF flows in 2015 and how flows into ETFs for more than index funds, active mutual funds, and, and hedge funds combined. Uh, 
And we talked about some of the reasons. You know, it, here again is a perfect example where an investor can get these institutional caliber professional strategies at, at the frac- at a fraction of the cost uh, of, of hedge funds or, or active mutual funds. You know, this is why you're seeing the shift to, to ETFs. This ETF and, and others like it are, this is exhibit A for the growth in the industry and why you see the flows that you do. You know, when you listen to West speak, clearly these guys are on their game. And, and while the ETF is not for every single person listening, what a tool. As a part of a well-balanced, low-cost, diversified portfolio, there's no way an individual investor could try to replicate that. And he made the case as to why the big guys can't do it either. It's it's really special, and this just one little one little piece of evidence uh, as we see the flows increase. Well, we'll have to leave it there. That is all the time we have for today's show. Again, I want to thank Wes Gray for joining us today. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com and also Apple iTunes. Check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, Mike Strain, Deputy Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, will join us to talk U.S. economy. We'll get Mike's thoughts on the current health of the economy and also find out what he's watching for in 2016. That's next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central. Until then, have a great week, everyone.